Morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll be reading from Ephesians, um, I mean, verses 11 to 14. Ephesians 1, verses 11 to 14. And I'm reading from the NASB 95. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for your indescribable gift for us. Lord, that you have given us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful to you, Lord, for the mercy that you have had upon us, for the redemption that we have in Christ, and that you called us to yourself as sons and daughters. And Lord, as we come to you this morning to study your word, Lord, we ask, as always, would you open our eyes, would you open our hearts, and help us hear and see and understand that which you want to teach us this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, what is the most important thing that you always have to carry with you when you travel internationally? It is your passport, isn't it? You always have to have your passport on you. Your passport is the most important travel document that you need to have on you when you enter another country's border. And all of us, Um, need our passports to travel. I mean, even the President of the United States of America, as powerful as he is, he still needs a passport to travel when uh, when he travels around the world. But do you know there are three people in this world, there are only three people in this world who don't need a passport to travel internationally. So those three people are the emperor of Japan, and his wife, the empress of Japan, and of course, the British monarch. These three people don't need a a passport to travel anywhere in the world. Now, in the case of the emperor of Japan, he is considered to be the direct descendant of the sun god in Japan. And they believe that it would be highly inappropriate to ask for the descendant of a god to have a passport to travel on the earth. That makes sense, don't you think? Well, whatever be their national beliefs, sovereign countries still require people to carry their documents when they travel and cross into their borders. And so, these three people have a bunch of staff that will do a lot of work before these guys travel. And they'll do a lot of background work so that they can travel without a passport unhindered when they cross borders. And the question that we are asking this morning is, what happens to us human beings when it is time for us to travel and leave the earth? 
What happens to us as human beings when we leave the earth and, and what do you and I need to do or have when we seek to enter eternity with God? Is there anything or anyone that is, um, anyone that is exempt from the basic requirement that God has placed on us humans? And the, and the answer is found in our text this morning in Ephesians, verses 11 to 14 of chapter 1. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now, if you remember the background to what is happening here, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and, uh, or churches rather, and in the first 10 verses, he is praising God for all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ as believers. And Paul says that God has chosen us he has predestined us for adoption to the praise of his glory. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood. That God has forgiven us our sins and our trespasses and, and, has, and has accepted the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And because of that, God accepts us positionally righteous. That, that, the, 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 that the righteousness of Christ himself has been imputed to us. And all of this happened through the grace of God that he lavished on us that you see in verse 8. And Paul says that this here is a mystery. This is the mystery of his will, the redemption that we have through the blood of Christ. And all of these happened, all of these things happened at just the right time. And, and the NASB uses the word administration. God chose the time, the administration, according to his own will, according to his own purpose in verse 9, when he brought everything together in Christ. And now we come to verses 11 to 14 this morning, where Paul is addressing two basic groups of people. And he is addressing them with respect to everything that he has said so far about God's plan for salvation for mankind. Verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. Now Paul is talking about the believing Jews here and he's not talking about the, about the Ephesian believers who, who were largely from a Gentile background, and we'll see that as very clearly as we move into the next verse. But Paul is including himself in the group, and he's talking about the Jewish believers in verse 11. And he says that we also have obtained an inheritance. Now, what is an inheritance? And an inheritance is something that is given to natural children as a part of the will of the father and the mother, isn't it? But that's not, that's not the meaning of the Greek word here at all. So which, which means that we'll have to study this a little further, don't we? And in order for us to understand the thrust of the text, we need to dive a little bit deeper into what, what Paul is saying here. So in the original, the phrase simply means that we were appointed by a lot. You know what a lot is, right? It's like a dice. You throw a dice. Or like when you, when you play the straw. So the Greek word is, is kleru here. It means to acquire or to take possession of or to appropriate. So various English translations um, translate this Greek word and this Greek phrase here quite differently. Now some translate it, as you can see here in the NASB. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we all use NASB 95 here. It says, as have, as have obtained an inheritance. Verse 11. 
And other translations, such as the NIV and the Geneva Bible, translates it as, we were chosen. The ASV says, we were made our heritage. And the RSV says that we have been appointed. And the Net Bible translates it completely different from all of these other translations. It says, in Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession. Now, can you see how different that particular translation is from what we see in your Bibles? The meaning here is, is entirely different from, from either obtaining an inheritance or being chosen or being appointed as in the other translations that we just read. So we can see that there is no real consensus amongst Bible translators or scholars as to how to translate this particular phrase in the Greek. So when, when a word is translated in, 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 a, in a specific manner, in a particular direction, we, we need to understand that it changes the meaning of the passage and sometimes it can change the theology of the passage too. So when we study God's word, brothers and sisters, we have to give it our utmost attention because it is, it is, it is a very important duty that the child of God can undertake. And how we read our Bible, the, the revelation of God has a real bearing on how we think and how we relate to God and how we live our lives. So here we see four basic views or four basic translations of this phrase, for, and, and we saw that in the different English translations. And, and it is important for us to know this because we read the word inheritance here. Look at, look at verse, um, verse 11. We read inheritance, and at the beginning we read, in him also we have and then say, oh, well, because Paul is saying this, maybe he is talking to the Jews. And maybe he's talking about the Jews having obtained an inheritance. And, of course, the inheritance probably must be the salvation of souls. And then it is followed by predestination. So it must be by predestination according to the will of God. So it is easy to come away with, with this from this verse, having understood of what Paul is saying here, but that is not what Paul is talking about here. He is not talking about the Jews obtaining salvation as an inheritance. Remember, inheritance in, in, in English is quite different from, from the way it is being used here. So the best translation that has the most scriptural and the best grammatical support would be, in him we have been made a heritage of God. And he's talking about the Jews here. And that's how the ASV translates it. Or the Net Bible, we too have been claimed as God's own possession. And, and that is consistent with what happens in the next verse. And we have support from the Old Testament where Israel is called God's possession. And we read this in several places in Deuteronomy. God is calling Israel his possession. I want us to stop and think for a minute. We are not God's, we are, we are not the inheritance, I mean we are the inheritance, we are God's possession that he is talking about. God is not our inheritance, but we are God's inheritance, or we are God's possession. So what Paul is saying here is that God is, God is taking the believing Jews for his own heritage and for his own possession. That the believing Jews also have become a part of the inheritance of God. That they, that, that they have become a part of the redeemed people of God. That they have a part in the redemption that the previous verses talked about. And, my, and, and in, the, in the previous sermon, we spoke quite a bit about redemption that is found in Christ. So they have a part in the church. So this verse, by deduction, means that the church, because he says, in him also we. So by deduction, it means that the church is basically or primarily made up of the nations. 
It's made up of the Gentiles, of which the believing Jews have now become a part of. They have become a portion of the church. The idea here is not that the Jews have received an inheritance, but that they have become God's inheritance. And it's similar to what Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.9, a people of God's own possession, he calls the church. A people of God's own possession. Though the church is God's possession. And verse 11 continues, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So now Paul is saying that the Jews have also been included in what God is doing. That is within the church. They're included because God has predestined them. God has predestined them to be included according to both, both what? His purpose and according to the counsel of his will. Now, these two words, counsel and will, have a very complex relationship within the scripture. And scholars have de debated this for a long time. Which comes first? What, what does counsel of God mean? What does the will of God mean? What does the counsel of his will mean? But if you consider all the places where this, these two words are used in the, in the New Testament, you can tell that there is a sense of deliberation that is involved. It's a, it, a careful thought, if you will. And an interaction is involved in what God has decided. So when Paul says that it is, the, it is after the counsel of God's will that they have an inheritance to, that is the Jews, what he's saying is that God has not made this decision lightly. God, in accordance to, with his great purpose... And according to his great wisdom, he has also predestined the Jews to become a part of the heritage of God. God's own possession, which is the church. Now, brothers and sisters, doesn't God do everything according to his will? I mean, everything that God does, does he not do according to his great purpose and according to his great plan? and according to his great counsel of his will. Think about your own life and, and see how the Lord has brought you through. I mean, when we, are in, when we are in difficulties, we are thinking, well, is God listening to me? Is God listening to my prayers? Is God watching me? Is, is he watching over me? Is he looking at me? Does he know what is happening in my life? But then six months down the, li uh, uh, down the lane, or, or one year later, or two years later, you would say, well, what God has done is beautiful, isn't it? So that's how God works. He's not, he's not erratic in, in how he works or how he deals with mankind. And, and the text here says that he did this according to his purpose. He did this according to his counsel, to the counsel of God. He did this according to his will. So three times... Three times it speaks of God's will, if you notice. So God is predestining the Jews too for the redemption through Jesus Christ. And, and this was not something that was determined outside of his will or it was not determined lightly. But he did this after the counsel of his will. That means he did, which essentially means that he did this according to his sovereign will. Now, while, while God has a plan for national Israel, he also has a plan for individual Jews, to the, to the, for the individual Jewish person today. And that plan is that the Jewish people may find redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and on what basis can they find redemption? And we see that in the next verse, verse 12. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory, he says. We who were the first to hope in Christ. So what does the word we 
mean? Does it include Paul? Yes, it includes Paul. And, and if it includes Paul, who is he talking about here? He's definitely not talking about the Gentile believers in Ephesus here. Because he's going to make a sharp contrast between the Jews and the Gentile believers later on in verse 13. So, so by including himself here, he makes it quite obvious that he's talking about the Jewish race or the Jewish people. And because Paul was a Jew, and the, the, and the larger context of this letter also supports the idea that, that, that that the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, we can assume that he is talking about the Jews here. Paul is a Jew, as, as he told um, the Philippians, when he wrote to the Philippians. What does he say? He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, isn't it? And as to the law, he calls himself a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. So Paul was most definitely a Jewish person, and he says that we were the first to hope in Christ. And he is talking here obviously about the believing Jews. The believing Jews who are the first to hope in Christ. And he says that they are now a part of God's possession of what God is doing now. Redeeming mankind to himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see that in the first 12 chapters of Acts. Because the first 12 chapters of Acts is all about the early church. And, and what was it made up of? Were there, were, were there um, Gentile believers in the early church? No, mostly it was made up of born-again Jews. And Jerusalem was the epicenter of, of the Christian church. And what was the message of the early church? That Jesus Christ is the Messiah that was prof uh, prophesied in the scriptures, in the Old Testament scriptures. That Jesus was going to come. The Messiah was going to come and suffer for the sins of mankind. And that he did. And Christ rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. And that he did. And that salvation is found in no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. And only by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ do we have salvation. And that's the message of the early church. And this, he says, is all for God's glory. The end of verse 12. The redemption in Christ, the bringing about of this great plan at the right time, the, the, the bringing together of the Jewish people into the plan of God by making them into a, a part of the heritage of God. All of this is for the glory of God. So in these two verses, verses 11 and 12, Paul is saying that, that the believing Jews are now a part of God's possession. Not only because they were chosen according to his purpose, but because they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul says in his letter to the, to the Romans. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. So the, the Jews need the Lord Jesus Christ just as much as the Gentiles need the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. And that is what Peter was saying to the high priests and the rulers of the people when, when, when people heard him uh, preach in Jerusalem and 5,000 people came to know the Lord. What does he say? Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for the benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, he's talking to the Jews, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And he goes on to say, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Remember, he is talking to the Jewish people in Jerusalem, to the elders, to the chief priests. And, and, and this makes sense when you look at what's happening in Israel today, isn't it? 
Have you watched the news? Have you been reading the news? The Orthodox Jewish people are fighting against Christians in Israel today. You just have to go online and look for the news and you'll see all the different ways and means and methods by which the Jews are harassing Christians and how they're persecuting Christians in the land of Israel. They don't want to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They don't want to believe that Jesus paid for their sins. They don't want to believe that they have redemption through the blood of Christ. They don't want to believe what the scripture is teaching so clearly here. That the Jews too, as Paul is saying here, have a heritage in God and can become a a possession of God or God's possession because they are predestined to this heritage if only they were to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, it, it, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your lineage is. You still need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You still need to believe and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. And I I, I say this because there are so many people out there today who actually don't believe this. And especially the Jews. Most Jews don't believe it. They trust in their lineage. Their hope is in their bloodline. And, and you, you probably have met some of these people. They, great, they go to great lengths to prove this, that, that, that they are related to the ancient um, Israelites. And I, I personally have known some people and I've heard of many others whose, whose Jewish roots are quite suspect. But still, they say if somehow they're able to trace themselves back to the ancient Israelites. Somehow they are able to trace themselves back to the bloodline, that they are secure, that they are special, they are chosen, and God is going to bless them. Let me tell you, no. No, you're not. You still need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you to be accepted by God, to become God's possession, as Paul says here. Because there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And the scripture is very clear. And so when you, when you talk like this, someone might say, oh, uh, well, does that mean that the church is now the new Israel? No, it is not. The church is not the new Israel. The church is not, the, not Israel. That is called replacement theology, that, that the church has somehow replaced Israel. Or the people of God. No, the church has not done that. The church and Israel are two different programs of God. And, and, and that, that is probably a topic for another day or maybe a maybe a Sunday school class perhaps, but, but I want you to know that this particular passage, Ephesians 1, um, 3 to 14, is used to support the claim of a covenant of grace. Which, and, and, and that covenant of grace is, is consequently used to support the idea or the notion that the church is the new Israel. And we don't agree with that. Salvation has always been, uh, always been through, through grace, through faith. It has always been by grace, through faith. And God has a plan for national Israel. And the church is, is just an uh, interruption in that plan. It is called a parenthesis, or, or Louis Perry Schaefer calls it an intercalation of God's plan, or God's dealings with national Israel. So the church is a spiritual entity that includes all people from everywhere, from all nationalities, from all ethnicities, including the Jews. And you'll see that later on in Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the uh, barrier of the dividing wall. Chapter 3, verse 9, and to bring to light 
What is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things? So the church is not Israel. But the, but the national Israel, on the other hand, is, is a totally different entity. And God's promise to Israel will come true. It, it will continue to stand, and it will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled at the great tribulation. But we won't be there. The church is not going to be there because we are going to be raptured. So therefore, the church is an interruption in the plan of God for Israel. So why am I spending so much time in talking about these things? It is because we are studying the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is about the doctrine of the church. It's Paul's primer on, on ecclesiology, the doctrine of church. And as we continue to study through the book of Ephesians, we'll discover what God's purpose for the church is. What God's purpose for us as Wally Bible Church is. The church is made up of everyone who believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. As we see in the next two verses, verse 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now that's a lot, isn't it? There are way too many ideas there. Let me see if I can break this down. So Paul changes the fo focus here. He is, he is moving his focus from the Jews to the Gentiles. And he's addressing the Gentile church because he says, in him you also... He's saying you, because in the previous verses, he said we. Now he's talking about you. So he's no longer talking about the Jews. He's talking, he's addressing a different audience here. And, and that's what he says in the next two verses. And, and that is universal in scope for the church today. And, and I think there are six things that we notice here very quickly. Verse 13. First is the listening. After listening to the message of the truth. He's speaking to the Gentiles, like I said. Listening is important because it gives rise to faith. What does the word of God say? The, and, and, and faith comes by listening. And listening to the word of God. So listening gives rise to faith because it is also a first-hand testimony of the person who is speaking or, or, or teaching the gospel or sharing the gospel truth with someone. It has affected his own life. And that is why we emphasize the preaching of the word of God. And that's why we emphasize the sharing of the gospel through words both from the pulpit and also in, 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 in personal evangelism with friends or with relatives. We share the gospel. We explain it to them so that they can hear, they can listen, because faith comes by listening. And secondly, it is the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what they heard, the, what, what the Ephesians heard was the message of truth. Paul calls this the gospel. The gospel is the message of truth. So the, what does the word gospel mean? The gospel itself means good news. It is good news because it has the power to deliver people from their sins and rescue them from an eternity in hell. It is the most important message that anybody can hear in their lifetimes. And this message, this gospel, is personal, as it leads to a personal conviction and a personal salvation, although here he is talking collectively to the Ephesian believers. And thirdly, it, you will see that it requires faith, because he says, having also believed, or in whom also when you believed, he says. 
So what is, what is required? A response is required after listening to the message of truth. A response from people, a response from a person is required for the message to have a bearing on his life. It is, it is belief in the message. It is belief in the gospel that is necessary for the gospel to have its effect on the person. Now, what is believing? Believing is simply accepting as true what has been heard or what has been communicated to you. So to believe also means to put your faith in it. To believe that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for us. He died for us as a sacrifice for our sins. He was buried and he rose again to give us eternal life. And we need to believe that. And faith in, in, in that is what causes salvation. So salvation requires that we put our faith and believe the message. And that's what he is talking about here. Number four, and what happens is, is, a, is a, as a result, is that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He says, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Or other translation says, the promised Holy Spirit. God promised the Holy Spirit for those who are his, for those who would believe. Now, sealed means it is a stamp. It is not like a Ziploc seal. Okay, so sealed here is a stamp. It is, it, it is like a rubber stamp that you would put on a legal document. Although the Holy Spirit will come to indwell within us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, but, but Paul is not talking about this here. Neither is he talking about the baptizing ministry of the Holy Spirit or, or the filling of the Spirit, although all of these things will happen when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and at the moment of conversion. But the sealing that he is talking about here is, is, is the sealing that simply identifies us believers as God's own. And that gives us the assurance of salvation. That we are God's possession. That we are his heritage. Like I said, it's like a rubber stamp on a legal document. It is a seal of ownership. It is a seal of certification that, that the reality of salvation is accrued to everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, even to the Gentiles. And the sealing, when does it happen? It happens as soon as someone believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is immediate. Just, just hearing the gospel does not do anything, brothers and sisters. You have to believe in the gospel it has to be followed by faith for the Lord to accept us. And when one puts his faith, his or her faith, in the Lord Jesus, the person is marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. So when you're sealed, we are marked his own. And that is the sign of our security in Christ. It assures us of the favor of God. It assures us that our salvation is forever and it is for sure and God is going to accept us and we are going to belong to God. Doesn't Paul say elsewhere, our spirit cries out with the spirit, Abba, Father? Verse 14, Paul says that it is a pledge. He says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance or the down payment of our inheritance it is it is an earnest money when you want to buy a house you go put down a little bit of money it's an earnest money that you put down so it's an earnest is a deposit that you are saying that the transaction will be completed and it will become a part, the earnest will become a part of the complete transaction later on. So here, God makes an earnest deposit to us by giving us the Holy Spirit and guaranteeing our salvation. It is the down payment or the first installment, if you will, for the rest of the transaction that the rest will follow. And, and in the New Testament, this, this particular word is used only three times. The Greek word is used only three times. 
Two other places in, are in Corinth, 2 Corinthians, and everywhere it is used, it is used to talk about the Holy Spirit as being an earnest deposit. The word pledge. It is a down payment. It is not a pledge in the sense that it has to be returned, but it is an earnest because it becomes part of the full payment later on. So the Holy Spirit is given to us as an earnest that God is going to give us the rest of the promised blessing in the future. And the inheritance that Paul is talking about here is the result of our salvation, a gift of eternity in heaven with God. And it is only accomplished by what we have seen in the first, first uh, 14 verses here. The Father's act of election, the Son's work of redemption, and the Spirit's work of sealing. Fifthly, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession for the purpose of our redemption. Now, the, the redemption here, the word redemption here, looks very similar to the redemption in verse 7, but it is not the same thing. It is not about, it, he's not talking about the forgiveness of sins, but the redemption here is talking about the final deliverance that we are going to obtain, final deliverance from evil, from sin, from sorrow, and from death, which will happen at the second coming of Christ the Lord. And we will be set free forever from the presence of sin. And that's the idea that is supported in, in, in chapter 4, verse 3. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, it says. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's the redemption that he is talking about here. So what does verse 5 say? He predestined us for what? For adoption, isn't it? For adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So we have, we have received this inheritance. We have been sealed. We have received the Holy Spirit as an earnest that God may be glorified. And finally, our sixth point today, to the praise of his glory, says Paul. Now, why does he say that? Look at verse 6. He ends that section saying, to the praise of the glory of God. And look at verse 12. End of verse 12. To the praise of the glory of God, or the, to the praise of his glory. And now in verse 14, to the praise of his glory. So he, he says that at the end of every section. When he mentions the Father's part in salvation, the Father's part which is the election, he says to the praise of the glory of God. When he talks about the Son's part in our salvation, the, the redemption, he says to the praise of the glory of God. And when he talks about the Spirit's part in our, in our salvation, he says to the praise of the glory of God. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all acting together to obtain our salvation to the glory of God. Our salvation is for the praise of His glory. From the election, to the redemption, to the sealing, everything is for the glory of God, brothers and sisters. Lest any man come and, and rise up, or any preacher rise up, or anybody, an evangelist rise up, and claim the glory to himself. It, no, it is for the glory of God. The gospel is contained in the word of God, and it is given to us, and it is for the glory of God. And that is the primary purpose of the church, too, as, as we will see, to the praise of the glory of God. So, what can we take away from this? What can we do about it this week, perhaps? Well, this is, a, this is a dense doctrinal section, but what we can do is praise God, isn't it? We can, but we, we can spend time every day in prayer for the next one week, and we can talk about it to people who don't know about the Lord Jesus Christ, but we can also praise God for what God has done for us, what the Father has done, what the Son has done, what the Spirit has done for us. 
So God has made this salvation available to both the Jews and the Gentiles and to everyone who believes. And he calls them his possession. He makes no distinction, friends. He accepts all who come to him. And that's the only passport that we will need. That's the only passport, the passport of faith. And guess what? As soon as you get the passport of faith, you also have a seal of the Holy Spirit on it. That we are going to go be with the Lord when we leave here, when we leave this boundary. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we are so grateful to you, Lord, for your precious word. We are grateful to you for using men like Paul. Lord, we are grateful to you for the Holy Spirit that gave these words to, to the apostles. We thank you for your word that you have kept it in the, in the form of, of the scripture today, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Lord, that you have made a way of salvation for us and you made, known, made it known to everybody. And all we have to do is come to you and believe. And we are grateful to you for this group of men and women who have come to know you, Lord, and we praise you and we worship you for, for bringing us to that point. We pray, Lord, that you would use us to take this message of the gospel, the message of deliverance, of redemption, to people that don't know you. Lord, that they too may be saved. Use us as instruments in your hands. And Lord, this morning we pray for the nation of Israel. Have mercy on those people. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would open their eyes. Lord, that you would open their eyes to see the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us this morning. To you be the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Christ's name, amen.